Thanks for being with us, everybody, wherever you're joining us from, whether you're joining us in the north at uh, our Prosper campus, uh, in the west at our uh, Louisville campus, east at our Garland campus, south at our Dallas campus, whether you're joining us in Boca, whether you're joining us a part of a global community, honestly, we're just glad you're here in the house. Will you help me applaud everybody that's here in the house, everybody? Thank you. Um, we're doing a sermon series, and it's called Meltdown, what to do when you're facing a meltdown from furnace to faith. So, ladies and gentlemen, last week we talked about um, Jonah. We, we wrestled with why is it that you got a preacher who loves when God forgives him but does not want to extend forgiveness to others, and then he had a meltdown because God blessed him with a tree and then took the tree away. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to deal with somebody else. His name is Nebuchadnezzar. We affectionately call him Nebi. Everybody say Nebi. Nebi. Yep, we're going to deal with Nebi today, and um, we're going to deal with the issue called success and prosperity. That's what we're going to deal with. It's the perfect topic for uh, one community church who lives in a very affluent community, wherever you are, whoever you are today, all of us, this message is for you. So look at, look at the person beside you and say, boy, God, God's talking to you today. <laughs> look at the other person on the other side and say, mm-hmm. <laughs> look at yourself and say, self. You should have left before now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you're here today, and if you know, if you know, if you have food in your refrigerator, and you know what you're going to eat after church, you're rich. If you're here today, and you got something that will cover your head tonight, whether it's your car, or whether it's an apartment, or whether it's a house, but you know where you're going to sleep tonight, you rich. If you're here today and you got clean drinking water, the Bible calls you rich. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm rich. Some of you don't even want to say, look at the other one and say, and say, uh-uh, he's talking to me, I'm rich. Uh-huh. So today we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about what to do to avoid a meltdown when you're rich. And we're going to look at the perfect dude to talk about this. And so let's see if we can pray and get started today. Father, will you guide us now as we go to your word? Lead us. Please, Lord, let, no, let our brains not tell our, let our heart not tell our, our brain that there's nothing uh, here for me. Will you remind us that this word is for each and every one of us? Lead us now and open our hearts and our minds in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's stand and read the word. We're going to read, first of all, in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, Moses is talking to the children of Israel, and he's reminding them, hey, listen, God did real good by you. He got you out of Egypt. He got you out of the wilderness. Here's what he says next. But be careful when you go to the promised land because you're going to, you have the tendency to forget how you got here and why you're here. Watch the text unfold. Deuteronomy chapter 8, let's pick it up in about verse number 2. Everybody ready? Let's read it with me. Say, rich person, read. Good, here we go. You shall remember all the way which God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years that he might testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would Where's he look? He's not looking at the outside. He's not looking at what you tell, because you're too smart for that. You're not going to tell nobody, look at what I did. You're not going to do that. You're just going to think it in your heart. You're not going to say it out loud. You're going to believe it in here. Watch what he says. To know what was in your heart. You got it. Next verse. Here we go. Here's what he says. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, 
nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth. See, too many of you still think that the way you really live is by the food you eat and the fancy restaurants you go to. The Bible is reminding us that if you're not feasting from the word of God, the meaning is that you don't understand how life really works. Watch the text. It gets better. Next verse. Here we go. He says, verse, no, I'll go to verse 10. He says, here we go. When you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has where did all your blessings come from? The good Lord. Good. Next verse. Beware that you do not the Lord your God by Mama and his ordinances and his statutes, which I... In other words, don't pick and choose which part of the Bible you want to embrace. Quit picking and choosing. Well, I like this one. I don't like this one. With regard to my taxes, I like this one, but I don't like this one. Oh, we're going to talk about taxes today. You should have gone home. We're going to talk about it in the name of Jesus. Let's go to verse 14. There we go. Next one. Here's what it says. It says, beware. No, no, no. Then your heart. Go to verse 12, please. Thank you. Here we go. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and lived. Hold on. Let me call and counterize it. When you have built your pools and you have your lounge chairs outside with your television and your little grill that you cook on and your kids are having the time of their lives and you're just thinking, I have made it. Oh my God, I've made it. That's what we're talking about. Here we go, next verse, 13. He says, and when you're, and you're multiply and when, stop. When your NVIDIA multiplies and your Bitcoin multiplies and you think it's because of your wisdom or your financial advisor's wisdom that you made this happen and all that you have multiplies, last verse, verse 14, it says, then your heart will be... And you who brought you out of, out of the When you now have enough money to go to the lake house and chill at the lake house on the weekends when you should be in the house of the Lord, but now your money has driven you away from your God. Or when you have enough money to go on vacation every other week. And so now, instead of being among the fellowship of the believers, your money has drifted you away. And all of a sudden, you want to worship online from Indonesia or from Bora Bora or from Australia. Or from, and all you care about now is what does life have to afford us because we can do anything we can. Be careful, one community. Don't let money grab hold of your heart. Ain't nothing wrong with being successful. Don't let success own you. I'm preaching to somebody today. I'm preaching to somebody today. Let's go to the next pericope. Here we go. Last one, verse 17. Here's what he's saying. Otherwise, you may say, stop right there. You're not going to say it out loud. You, because you're, too, you're smarter than that. But in your heart, you're going to be like, this one you walk by and somebody say, hey man, you did good. And you'll be like, yeah, dog, yeah, dog. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, this one you park your car far off so ain't nobody can get close to your fancy car. It's in your heart. It's in, not your heart. It's in your heart. My power and the strength of Be careful, one community. The more God blesses you, it's a dangerous thing because a better man and a better woman than you have failed because of it. So be careful. And don't think, it won't happen to me. Here we go. Last verse. Come on, we can't take no more. Is there another one or is that it? Uh, we can't take no more. No, that's good. Sit down. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. We can't take no more in the name of Jesus. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to remind you of three axioms that you need to remember when dealing with this word called success. This is so important for everybody in the house to get today. Here we go. There are three of them. It's on your notes. The first one says, before there is a blessing, there is always a testing. God wants to give you more influence. God wants to give you more success. He wants to give you better spiritual experiences. But before he can bless you, the way he works is he's got to test you. Number two, we're getting to the third one, which is really my main point. God will test you with stress before he trusts you with success. If you can't handle stress at this level, you cannot handle success at this level. And he's reminding you that be careful what you ask for, be careful what you pray for, because the more you pray for it, if he gives you, it might kill you. Be careful. Watch the third one now. There, there, there are two tests that got every believer gets. It's the test of suffering and the test of success. I'm begging you to listen to this. It's the test of suffering and it's the test of success. Success is as much a test as suffering is. Listen to me, please. Nine out of ten people will pass the suffering test. Why? Because when you're suffering, the only person you got to go to is God because you're in need of him. When success shows up, watch it now, you don't need God. So you don't even realize it's a test. So your tendency is to think, I'm good. Life's easy. Things are going well. But let me remind you of what God's going to do. It's a classroom, and if you fail the test this month, he's going to give you the same test next month. And if you fail it next year, this year, Same test, same desk. Let's see if you're going to pass. He said, Pastor, I've passed this test. How do I know? So if you pass the test, why is it that only 9% of this church tithe? If you're doing so good and God's blessed you so much, why is it that only 9% of this church realize that the way I show God that I get where this comes from is by honoring him with my giving first before I do anything else? Why is it that God shows up last, if at all, in your giving? Oh, y'all quiet? No, don't be quiet now. Say, yeah, dog. Preach this thing, dog. Say, yeah, dog. Say, yeah. That's what you're supposed to be doing now. Say it. Preach it. But you don't want me to because you really are convinced in your heart that it's your money. And now why would I give it to God when I made this on my own? The way to, 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 to evaluate how you're doing and if you're passing the test, that's why Malachi says, test me and see. Let's test me. Because what most of us have done is we've said, God, this is my money. Leave me alone. I'm going to do with it what I see fit. And you're failing the success test. Nine out of ten people pass the suffering test. One out of ten people pass the success test. You say, Pastor, okay. All right, you move on. Go to something else. Okay, so why, if God's blessed you like this, are you still trying to rip off the government in your taxes tomorrow? You want to, you're ripping off God. But then some of you say, God ain't enough, let me rip off the government. 
which is why you go on a week's vacation, you have one meeting on the Monday, and then you want to write off the whole vacation as if it's a tax write-off because you think you're so smart, you think you're so good, and you can take from the government what's due to the government. Preach, pastor! Mm -hmm. Some of you are like, can I leave now? No. Not just yet. We almost done it. <laughs> but why is it that when it comes to money, we have almost said to God, God, we believe in money more than we believe in you. You said, Pastor, I haven't said that. No, you just live it out with the way you live it. Which is why you look at the stock market more than you look at your word. Which is why everything on your phone, oh yeah, let me see what, what we're doing today. How's it looking today? Oh my God, it's a down day. Why is it that the market determines how you feel, not God's word? Why is it you care more about your, your, your real estate portfolio more than you care about the word of God? Why is it that you're investing, ooh, Holy Ghost. Why is it that you're investing and you can't wait for your next check to invest some more, but you don't invest in no human being with the word of God? Well, I'm just asking the question, why? Because it's a test and you're not doing good in the test because you're investing more in stuff that will make you rich than in what will make heaven plenty. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just trying to help you today. I'm, I'm trying to teach you so that you can set yourself up for more. And the way it's going now is you're saying to God, I don't need you. You're not saying it with your mouth, but you're saying it with your behavior. When I look at what you think about the most, it's not the word or God's people. It's your money because your money has gotten to you. I want, I want, I want to do a lap today because you're all so quiet. Here we go. Let's move on. So in light of that, in light of that, here are the two questions to discern your future. Question number one, are you faithful with what is not your own? Are you and I faithful? How, how are you doing on your job? I know you don't own the company, but are you really faithful on your job? Are you really? Are you working as if you're working for an audience of one, which is Jesus? Or are you working as if, man, I, I want to do my own thing, so, so I'm going to do my own thing while they pay me. They're paying me to do my own thing. Then you're not setting yourself up for self. Okay, you're not feeling me. What, here, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. How do you treat a car when you rent it? <laughs> How you treat the car? That you rent. You're jumping off curbs and stuff? What, what you doing? <laughs> it ain't my car. God bless him. And I, the, the, the shock's still in, in, intact. I'm good. How are you treating it? Oh, let, let's flip the script. Suppose it was your car. And you, is that how you would want somebody to treat your car? Be careful because how you treat what is not yours, God uses to determine whether you can handle more. By the way, he also uses that to determine who he should give you to work with you. So since you were a fool on the job, he's going to give you fools to work with. Because you can't be trusted. Because you weren't faithful given the opportunity. So there's some of you that need to go confess to your bosses and your supervisors and your managers or your employees. I'm sorry for the way I've treated you. It was not becoming of a godly man or a godly woman. Number two, second thing that determines it is this. How can you handle what God is about to do in your life? See, if you're going to handle that, there are three things you need to consider. Is your circle ready to handle where God's taking you? Is your people circle ready to handle where God is taking you? Because if you're the smartest person in your room, ladies and gentlemen, then maybe you need a new room. Listen to why. Because if, if you want everybody to come to you and ask you questions, if you want everybody to come to you and say, hey, how do you do this? Then you need a new room because wherever he's taking you, you cannot be the smartest person in that room. The second one is can your character handle it? 
Can you, is, is there some cracks in the character that when you're under the bright lights of the next level, it's going to expose you? What is it? Which aspect of the fruit of the Spirit do you need to be working on now so that when you go to the next level, you have fortified it? Because if you don't, the next level, all it's going to do is expose you. Ladies and gentlemen, can you handle what God is about to do? There are three questions, that are three issues that Nebuchadnezzar got when he wrestled with this. Now we're talking about Nebi. You know the, the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Let me give you a quick summary. Nebuchadnezzar was this king. Um, he used to be the general in his dad's army. Then he became king. He is such, he is such a big uh, image that he built a whole statue of himself and asked everybody to worship him. He was, he, was, he was so powerful, every nation he faced, he defeated them. He had success after success after success. He didn't have to do anything, and he just had more success. He was the ultimate superpower of his day. And God said, Nebi, I don't like how you're handling this thing called success. Nebi, if you don't handle it well, it will be taken from you. Listen, family. And so Nebuchadnezzar says, God, look at what I have done. So then he has a dream. This dream shows up. The dream is a tall tree. And in the tree, the tree can be seen in everywhere in the whole earth. And on this tree, everybody comes to it for food. Everybody comes to it for shade. Everybody comes to it because everybody is calling the name Nebuchadnezzar. Watch what happens now. Three things he did that was egregious to God. Number one. He grew dull to what God had revealed to him. Nebuchadnezzar grew dull. Some of you, have you, ever, have you ever pressed a shirt? Lord of mercy. Have you ever pressed a shirt? And at the end of your time, <laughs> and at the end of your time, <laughs> when you press the shirt, that's how it looks. Because the iron's been on there so long trying to, trying to straighten you out, but you don't want to be straightened out. And so all of a sudden, this is what happens. Listen, you know, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 says, it says that um, over time, your conscience becomes seared. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? That means you no longer respond to God when he's talking. It, 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 could it be that God's been trying to get your attention about tithing? God's been trying to get your attention about stop robbing the government? God's been trying to get your attention about giving and releasing it to others, and you keep saying no? And so now he, he, he's yelling at you, can you please? And you can't hear nothing because he's asked you so, for such a long time, and you have quenched the spirit. That's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Second thing we learned from him, three mistakes he made. Do not miss this one. He wanted heaven right now, right here on earth. The, the reason you don't pray for heaven is because you love earth too much. The reason you're not begging God to come back is because you're not concerned about what happens in heaven. You're only concerned about building your kingdom here. The reason you're not passionate about people being one to Christ and about people getting baptized, the reason you're not is because you're so consumed with what God has blessed you with that you don't care one rip. And it's not until you get cancer that all of a sudden you want to pray, God, come quickly, please, God, come quickly. Why is it that when he blesses us with success, we can't pass the test and realize that, God, I'm just, I'm, I'm not, and I will not be a cul-de-sac that this blessing ends with, but I'll be a conduit through which you can bless other people. Why is it that we're not praying for heaven more? Because we are creating our own heaven here where everything is nice and everything is fine and everything is wonderful. Number three, third one, it says this, he listened to the wrong people. Many of us, that's what we're doing. We're listening to Warren Buffett, and nothing wrong with listening to Warren, but Warren ain't God. We listen to all our little coaches that tell, hey, man, up and to the right, up and to the right. You know, I'm good. Yeah, you know, I'm good. <laughs> when was the last time you read your word and you saw what God had to say to your own heart? A customized word to you. When was the last time that happened? It doesn't because we're not in the Word. It doesn't because we're not, we're, not, we're not feeding ourselves with the Word of God. Turn your page over now. Let's see if we can get 
down to really where we want to go, and then we're done. The three questions to discern where we are, then we're done. Here we go. Question number one simply says, why do successful people get in trouble? Why is it that all successful people start losing their families, their kids hate them, their wives leave them, their husbands leave them? Why does it happen all the time? And you'll be like, not me, not me, no sir, not me, not me. Okay, keep living. How do you handle that? Question number two we're going to wrestle with real quickly is, how do I recover if I've blown it? And then question number three is, if I'm successful, how do I make sure I don't end up in meltdown? How do I do that? So some of you are still saying, Pastor, that's not me. I'm not prideful. I'm just a regular dude. I'm not prideful. I'm good. No, that's not me. So let's see if we can help you out. Here's how you know you're in meltdown. Here's how you know you are. If you ever said any of these phrases, you're headed there. God, I'm deserving of more praise on my job. God, they don't honor me enough in my home. God, they don't, they don't make me the preferred choice. God, I know better than they do, and they still don't consult me. God, I, I need them to realize how good I am, and they need to approve my uh, raise, my, my, my promotion, so that they can, they can give me the, the honor that I'm due. God, will you make life easy for me? I got it too hard right now. God, will you let them stop criticizing me on social media? Will you let them stop criticizing me in my work? God, allow me to be chosen. I want to be the chosen one. I want people to say, yeah, let's choose him. Let's choose her. God, will you let them remember who I really am? God, will you remove this pain from me, this frustration? God, this suffering is too much for me, man. Get rid of it. God, I don't think you're just. God, will you set others aside so I may be chosen? God, will you let everybody else go unnoticed so I may be praised? God, will you grant me the grace to be desired? Jesus, will you let people think I'm amazing? Jesus, will you make sure that they see my strength, my wisdom, my intuition? Will you show them that my way is better than theirs? If that's you, then you're walking down the pathway of pride and you're headed toward a meltdown. If you ever are craving it, then without even knowing it, you're failing the test and you're headed toward, say it with me everybody, a meltdown. That's where you're headed. Why? Pastor, why is that the case? How do you know that for a fact? I know it for a fact because here's what the Bible says. The Bible says it this way. The Bible says, listen, God says, if you're here today, it is my assignment that those who are humble... I believe in them. And my job is to, if you humble yourself, I'm going to elevate you. If you humble yourself, I'm going to make sure that things go well with you, which is why my son epitomized that. That's what I'm going to do because I, I am a friend to those who are humble. Not just, not just fake humble, not just humble brag, hey, man, we did good, look at God. Don't put God on your arrogance. Because we do it all the time. Man, it's just not me, man. Look at God, man. Can't believe I made a meal this year, dog. But oh my God, I made a meal. Look at what the Lord has done. That's called humble brag. Preach, pastor. Preach, pastor. Preach, pastor. Preach. In other words, God says, if I find out that in you, you are one community church, reeks with pride then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go on the opposite side of you and I'm going to make sure as your stock rises and as you start showing off and as you start telling everybody how great you are, I'm going to make sure that I come on this side and make sure you go as low as you can go because I'm going to be against you. Because God says, if you're prideful, I resist against you. No, I don't do, I don't, I don't do, because you're not that good. So don't believe your press report. You're not that good. And really, the real reason you're where you are, is because of me. Not because of your little education, not because of your little fact. Although those things are important. In no way am I saying you shouldn't be successful. In no way am I saying you shouldn't go after education. You shouldn't, it, I, what I am saying is, don't let it control you. I appreciate the two people that just clapped. 
<laughs> Here's what he's saying. For real, y'all. We got to get this one. Here we go. Let's go. How do, you, how do successful people get in trouble? It's, it's not that hard. Look, successful people get in trouble because here's what we do. We get comfortable, don't we? We get complacent, don't we? We get complacent with it. We start just sitting down and, and just wondering, how. wow, look how far I've come. Wow, look how, look how, look, look what I've done with the little I started with. Wow, look at me. Wow, look at my kids. My kids get to do whatever they want to do now. I didn't get to do that, but they get to do it. Wow, things are going good. Good God. Nowhere mentioning God. Or if you do, you mention it and say, don't look like a plum fool. You say, I mean, look what God has done. But really, you think it's your hard work. All I'm trying to suggest is this is why he got in trouble. Nebuchadnezzar was sitting back saying, hey, man. I'm satisfied. I'm comfortable. This is great. This is how it should be. Everybody's coming to me. The second one, though, gets a little more dangerous because he says, you're ignoring my warning signs. Is the second one. He says, you're ignoring them. And so, Pastor, how do we know what our warning signs? Well, let me give you Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel told him. He had a dream, couldn't interpret the dream. Big old tree, all that stuff. And Daniel said, you the tree. And you're going to be cut down. And we're going to destroy you. God's going to destroy you because of your arrogance. 12 months before he told him this. And 12 months goes by and he does nothing. Doesn't that sound like you and me sometimes? God's trying to get our attention. Maybe with the conflict you have in your life. Maybe with chaos you have in your life. Maybe with some confusion that you have in the company. Maybe with temptations that you're still not battling. And maybe you've seen the goodness of God and ignore it. Maybe you've returned to sin once things starts to get better. And he gives you a plan, say, all right, deal with it, you don't. And so it comes up again. And so now you're ignoring the warning signs. And what happens at the end of 12 months when he ignored it? He cut the tree down. But he leaves the stump because he wants Nebuchadnezzar to know, if you ever follow me, maybe I will raise you up again. So that, you see the grace of God in the midst, in the midst of his discipline, he's still gracious. And then the third one, the third thing you got to do, here's why smart people get in trouble, because they delay obedience. This is not what they do. They put it off. They procrastinate. They defer, and they, they ignore. They say, ah, I'll do it tomorrow. Ah, I'm not going to do it today. Here's the problem. The more lights you have coming after you, ladies and gentlemen, the more lights you have, the more dangerous this thing gets. Here's the problem. The more you're in the light, the more you can't see well. The more you can't see well, the more danger comes your way. Don't love the light. Make a predecision. Don't be driven by the amount of people that like what you do on social media. Don't be driven by the media knowing your name. Don't be driven by that because the more you look into this light, the less you can see all around you and the more likely you are to make a stupid decision. I am pleading with you. D d d run away. Run, turn the light off. Hide from the light. Tell them, no, I don't want to talk to you. Because it does something with the hardiness of your heart. When you get, when you get to tell everybody, hey man, look at me, I'm on TV. Today. What? No, no. Stay away from that. The same people who build you up will tear you down every time I'm pleading with you don't, don't rush it don't like it don't, don't crave it let God elevate you don't try to elevate don't try to wheel and deal to make a name let God in his perfect timing elevate you so that's, what you, that's why successful people get in trouble what happens now when, when, when you're already in it you're already in the drama and you're in trouble. Here's what you do. There are three things you do. You, you, you look up, then you wake up because his lust is mine, and then you speak up. The three things you do. Here you go. So, so I'm going to read this passage in a minute, but here's what you do. You look up, you wake up, you speak up. Well, here's the warning. Don't forget the Lord. What did Nebuchadnezzar do? God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to become, to be turned into almost like an animal. The hair all around him was like, the, like that of an animal. His nails were that like an animal. And he grazed in the fields. And he did it for seven long years. All because of pride. 
So why would we ever think, ever fix our mouths to say, look what I did? You're headed in the same direction as this man. So what do you do when, you, when you're in the meltdown and you can't believe you found yourself here? Say it with me, everybody, you. And then you. And then you. It's all in the text. Go to verse 34. Watch it real quickly. Verse 34 says, but at the end of that period, that's the period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, here's what he did. Number one, raised my eyes toward heaven. Number two, and my reasoning returned to me. So he looked up. He woke up mentally, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him. So the three things he did, go back to them again. Three things. Well, you know what happened last week? No, that happened last week. Everybody came in town to look at the eclipse. What did they do? They looked up. What happened when they looked up? They were mesmerized by the God of this world, that's the, by the God of heaven that says, look at what I can do whenever I want to. Look what I've created. And then guess what they started to do? They started to tell everybody, here's the unique picture I got. Look at how this looks great. Here it is. And here's what he wants believers to do. In the same way he wants you to look up every day, which is why we gave you a playlist. Because we realize it, that some people only come to church to worship. They don't worship every day of the week. So on the card you have is a playlist. Because I want you to, do, to be seven days a week worshipers. When you look at everything God has created, there's only one response. And that is to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so instead of listening to all the foolish music you listen to, you ought to turn it on and give God praise daily. You want to pass the test? You praise God every day, realizing where his goodness comes from, where your wealth comes from. It's not coming from you. It's coming from the grace and the mercy of your God. Then he got his mind. You know why? We give you that book to read, the 21 days, so that you can start reading and being a self-feeder. When you listen to other people preach, you listen to what God told them, not what God customized for you. When you go to your own word, God is telling you, here is what I have for you today. And yet still we have too many people eating chewed up word every single day of the week. You're listening to your favorite person. It's either money or, or somebody else preaching or whatever. And you're learning from somebody else. But when is it that God has this time to customize his word to you? Be careful. The more money you have, the more you need God to speak to you. Because every time you, should, you, you might not should go after the next deal. Sometimes he wants you to bless somebody else with it. It's not, it's not for the next deal this time. It's to bless somebody else. And then he says, I want you to speak up. I want you to tell everybody you know about the greatness of me, Yahweh. So he says, and then lastly, we're done on this one. The third one he says now, next thing I want to do is ask, if you are successful, that's, 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 that's all of us here. And you have not faced a meltdown yet. How do I make sure I don't face a meltdown? That's the question. Go to the bottom part of your sermon notes and watch what he says now. He says, there are three things I want you to do. do please put the asterisk beside these. Remember these. Pray for these for your own life. God's kingdom will outlast yours, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, don't live for your kingdom. God's kingdom will outlast yours. So make sure when I look at your bank account, when I look at your, at your brokerage account, when I look at it, I see the belief that you believe God's kingdom will outlast yours. That you believe I have to be giving to the kingdom of God and not just to my small kingdom. Every president there is will realize one day God's kingdom outlasted yours. Every prime minister there is will realize God's kingdom will outlast you. You can be the man for four years in this country, maybe for 30 years in China, maybe for another 40 years in Russia. But listen to me, you're going to die one day, but God's kingdom will still thrive. Here's what he says. Here's what he says. Here's what he says. Whenever you see a tightrope walker uh, going across a path. I almost did it for real, for real. I almost hooked up something from here straight up so I could walk across it. And I thought, I thought that might make the news. So let's not do that. All right. Here's why, here's why they hold one of these. You know why they hold one of these? For balance. They hold it for stability purposes. So that if, if, if they start leaning on one side, then they know they need to bring the right hand up over so that they can regain the balance before they take the next step. Here's what I'm suggesting to you today. Here's how you know 
that you are making sure you're stabilizing yourself with all that God has done for you. Number one, you're realizing that God's kingdom will outlast mine, which therefore means I better honor God every day because I'm not living for my kingdom, I'm living for his. Number two, he says, read it with me, everybody. Second one, he says, you got to remember God's approval matters more than all others. There are too many people still living for your, for your daddy's respect. You're living for your daddy's respect. Well, my daddy didn't think it. He thought I wouldn't have made it, but I'm going to show him. I'm going to show him. You're going to come to a crash. The word that you need is to know that God, just like he said to his own son, behold my son with whom I'm well pleased. Who you want to be well pleased is God, not, your, not somebody who hated you and thought you ain't going to make it. Quit living to prove other people wrong. Live to the delight of your heavenly father. That's the one that you should care deeply about. If you want to be stabilized, then you got to say, God, what are you saying to me today? Give me your word. Give me your affirmation because your word matters above all else. And then the last one says that God's power can overcome. Every God's power is bigger than your problems. In other words, he's saying, it doesn't matter what the problem you're facing today. You've got a God who's, who's bigger than that problem. And his power can overcome that problem no matter what you're going through on today. In light of that, ladies and gentlemen, I want to read a prayer for you. And everybody's going to get it when you leave today because I think it's, the, it's one of the saving graces of my own life and I hope it is for yours too. As you go out today, you're going to get it. But I want you to read it today with me. So I want everybody to stand. And I want you to read this in closing. Everybody to stand. And I want you to read it in closing. By God today. The prayer was written in the 1800s. You got to go back far sometime. Because this generation loved two, two sentences prayer. But not this one. Here we go. Watch it with me. Everybody read. Make sure the person beside you reading it. And you're going to find yourself somewhere in this prayer. Everybody ready? One, two, three. From the desire of being praised... Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of comfort and ease, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being criticized, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being passed over, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being, deliver me, Jesus. No, 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 hold on. Next phrase. Here we go. I ain't done with you yet. Next one. Ready? Here we go. Here we go. Ooh, hold on. Ooh. Take a deep breath because it gets harder. Whew. That others may be loved more than I, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire. Good God. That others may be chosen and I set aside, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire. That others may be praised and I unnoticed. Jesus, grant me the grace to this. Just hold on, take a deep breath again. Oh God, oh God, oh God, help me. If none of these apply to you, you dead. Here we go. Cause some of you be like, yeah, mm -mm, I do all those. Here we go. Last one. <laughs> Let's see if we can land on this one. Oh Jesus, meek and humble of heart. Make my heart like yours. Oh, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, strengthen me with your spirit. Oh, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, teach me your ways. Oh, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, help me put my self-importance aside to learn the kind of cooperation with others that makes possible the presence of your Abba's household. Amen. My God, today, if I were you, I'd make it my screensaver so that I always prayed every single day of my life. So when I'm set aside and somebody else gets first, 
I'm okay with it. Will you pray with me, everybody? Heavenly Father, help everybody in this house to pass the test. Help me to pass it. Help our leaders to pass it. Help our business owners to pass it. Help our entrepreneurs to pass it. Help every person under the sound of my voice to pass the success test. Teach us, God, how to be okay when we don't get to be first. Teach us, God, how to be okay when we put your agenda above ours, when we crave your approval above all others. Teach us, God, how to remember and realize that you've got all power to solve any situation we are in. Help us now to shine the light of Jesus as we go through these doors. Help us to show the world what it looks like to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, 